Um, so if you're already tired of uh, plasma input functions, I want to make a quick note, don't leave the room yet because I think optics is very different than the other modalities that you've seen and there are other uh, applications that you can, you can explore uh, for measuring the plasma input function. Um, so the main difference with, with optics, it, it's potentially um, much more sensitive than the other imaging modalities. However, your signal doesn't travel very far through tissue, so it's got limitations in that case. But the sensitivity allows you to measure things very quickly, um, which gives you an opportunity to, to extract plasma input functions in other ways. Um, so obviously the the, uh, oh, I wanted to make a note here. I think of plasma input functions in sort of two camps. Obviously there's a continuum between these two things, but I think of plasma input functions in terms of either whether you want to look at the first pass kinetics, which is very quick time scale, so maybe on the order of a minute. Uh, so you'll see like the, the first pass and then maybe even recirculation a second pass, something like that in your tracer. Uh, however, you know, most uh, kinetic studies, binding studies, are more interested in long-term plasma input curves that often look like bi-exponentials or something like that, uh, where you're interested in the plasma input function over uh, hours. Um, so the first pass kinetics, I'm not going to talk too much about this, but this is really more, you can get very high sensitivity to blood flow, blood volume, and vascular permeability, sort of your K1 and K2 parameters. And with the binding kinetics, that's where you can still have some sensitivity to vascular permeability, obviously, as, as Professor Lemertzma showed, uh, but it, it offers you sensitivity now to, to binding, which happens typically at a slower rate uh, on the K3 and K4 order. So Dr. Hoisman did a great job talking about the different ways that you can um, do blood sampling and, and measure concentrations from that. You can certainly do very similar things with, with optics, whereas in, in PET, you need a well counter or a scintillator or something like that to measure the signal. In optics, it's just a spectrophotometer. So I don't want to spend a lot of time on this, but essentially you could do blood sampling in many different ways. Put your samples in a spe spectrophotometer, spin out the... Uh, red blood cells so that you just have the plasma and you can measure the absorption characteristics of that sample as a function of wavelength. And your, the, typically the tracer you have will have a very distinct absorption pattern in, in those wavelength ranges. This particular one here is a very commonly used tracer in optics. It's indocyanine green. Um, you can see here actually um, the previous speaker talked about nonlinearities in measurement. This particular tracer has some nonlinearities in, in uh, optical absorption at very high concentrations, and this is actually because it starts binding to itself. Um, so you, you want to be aware of this for whatever trace that you're looking at as well. Um, so from one thing that we've been trying out lately uh, with, with optics, because you can sort of, uh, in, especially in preclinical models, you can make things very invasive if it's... Uh, it, um, if it's an acute study, um, we've been trying to measure the plasma input function directly from a carotid artery in the field of view of imaging. So it's not a beautiful picture, but this is uh, the neck of a mouse here. We've removed the skin. We've put some sort of saran wrap type uh, thing over top so that this tissue doesn't dry out, put some PBS in there. And then we've actually slided this black piece here. We've slided a black felt underneath the uh, the carotid arteries so that we can get rid of any background signal and we can measure the, the, the uptake of our tracer, and in this case it's going to be a fluorescent tracer, uh, directly from the carotids. Um, so this is a, uh, just a fluorescent image very early on at two minutes after injection. You know, you can do this later on and get the kinetics of that then. Um, and in this case, a lot of our studies were interested in, in imaging more than one tracer at once. It's another advantage of optics over some of the other modalities, although it is possible, it's just more difficult. But in optics, if you have two fluorophores that emit light at different colors or two absorbers that absorb light at different colors, you can resolve them quite easily. Um, and oh, this is a, just a slide showing that we're, we're dealing with motion artifacts by looking at sort of a white light image on, on a, 
time by time basis in optimizing where where our signal is coming from. Uh, but you can get then uptake curves over uh, over at least the the binding kinetic time range that I was talking about for two different tracers. And you see these two tracers that we're looking at have very different plasma input functions. And this is actually brand new data, and we're still working on the uh, validating this with uh, blood sampling. So I don't have that information yet. Uh, you can also do this on a much faster time scale and get sort of that first pass kinetics. That's what we're showing here. Um, so that's sort of uh, exposing the carotid and measuring the input function directly from the carotid artery. Now, obviously, that's very invasive, and you wouldn't want to do this on a, uh, if it, if it was a continuous study or definitely not a human. And there, but there are ways of uh, measuring the arterial input function, or at least components of, of arterial uh, um, chromophores are measured every day. And most of you are familiar with pulse oximetry. You put a little thing on your finger, some red light shines through your finger, and somehow it gives you a measure of your blood oxygenation. But it's really looking at the differences in absorption properties of oxygenated hemoglobin and deoxygenated hemoglobin. So um, I'll flip through that quickly, but and then I'm going to show you that you can also look at absorption of a tracer at the same time. So basically, this is what I mentioned, how pulse uh, oximetry works is uh, the vessels will expand and contract at a rate uh, equivalent to the heart heartbeat as the the blood is the pulse flow flows pulsing through the the vessels they expand and and then at diastole they contract and so if you put shine a light over some tissue here and look at the change in your oops, the change in your uh, absorption spectrum as a function of time, then any changes are only due to the arterial volume, not other tissues. So you can, since you're only looking at the arterial volume, then any changes then are due to really in the near infrared uh, spectrum just due to oxygenated hemoglobin and deoxygenated hemoglobin. And so you can maybe, most pulse, pulse oximeters typically measure this absorption um, at two wavelengths, one more sensitive to deoxyhemoglobin, one more sensitive to, to oxyhemoglobin. And then you can, I'm not going to go into this, but you can play some tricks with math. Uh, and some of the um, uh, biases cancel out when you, when you look at a, a ratio. And that ratio here is supposed to be oxygenated hemoglobin divided by deoxygenated hemoglobin, which obviously you can use to get your um, arterial oxygen saturation. And it was a group out of uh, Japan that realized that you could use this same approach and instead of just two um, absorbers of light, the oxy and the deoxy, you could add in another absorber, let's say endocyanine green, and you could actually, and since you assumed at time zero that you had no endocyanine green and you are only quantifying changes in concentration, you can actually get the absolute concentration of that absorber. And you can then use that pulse oximetry, pulse dye densitometry is what they called it, uh, measure it over time. And there's like a pre-dip, that's something to do with how their uh, system um, normalizes or uh, averages over time. It sort of has a moving average that dips as it goes. Um, but you can very nicely see sort of the first pass uh, bolus and the recirculation. This is a data actually from a, a newborn piglet, some research that I used to do in my PhD studies. Um, so they showed that there was a nice correlation between their pulse dye de densitometry and the blood concentration. So it's a nice way, and this can be done in humans. Um, the, and this is sort of the old version of the system. I think they have new versions now. This is what I used to work with. And I think it's mainly used uh, for, they can either measure cardiac output with it, or they're looking at the functionality of the liver, how fast their endocyanin green goes, uh, is uh, removed from the blood in a certain patient. But obviously, you can use those curves for any of the uh, uh, compartmental modeling uh, that Professor Limeritzma talked about, or the previous speakers. Um, one other thing is that you actually don't need that fancy system that the Japanese group uh, designed. Um, if you inject an 
uh, endocyanin green into a regular pulse oximeter that you have on, you'll see that the oxygenation will just change over time and it'll have a very characteristic shape. And so in, it, it's really just an error in how it measures the oxygenation, but you can use this error. Um, we just published a paper on this. You can use this error to basically tease out what the arterial input function is. So you don't need a fancy system. You can do it just from a pulse oximeter. As long as your, your tracer absorbs in one of the wavelengths that the pulse oximeter has in it. Um, so this is, oh, this is, uh, so this was done um, with a, this was done in a larger animal. You can do this, uh, there is a few, there are a few options for doing pulse oximetry in, in mice now. So we tr tested this out in mice. Um, you get some discretization problems, um, but you can compare it to a regular pulse dye densitometer um, and it, it, this approach seems to work quite well. So this is, I mean, this is just an example of one of the um, mouse pulse oximeters that, that are out there. Obviously with, uh, you know, 10 hertz uh, heart rate in mice or 600 beats per minute, it's very difficult to do this in mice. So you need uh, specialized hardware. Um, and actually our, um, our initial use of this, uh, you can use this fairly accurately to measure uh, sort of first pass uh, bolus um, because you have a very high concentration, but it's m much more difficult to get accurate measures of sort of that binding kinetic plasma input function. So if that's what you want, uh, it seems at this point at least the hardware uh, needs some improvements. Uh, one other approach, this is very similar uh, to um, what uh, Dr. Huisman was talking about with um, uh, an image-derived plasma input put function. Um, in small animals, you can attempt to measure the plasma input function using uh, some sort of tomographic uh, approach where you try to um, localize where your signal is coming from inside the animal. So if you know where the heart is with some anatomical priors, you can try and measure the concentration just in the heart cavity and hopefully that is uh, proportional then to uh, the, the actual blood concentration input that you want. Um, I'm probably not doing a very good job of this. This is work out of Washington University and uh, Dr. Solomon will be giving a, a talk on Friday in the morning. If you're more interested in this, she'll, uh, this is her work, so uh, she'll be able to go into more depth. But essentially, she's, she's got some results that suggest if she compares her image-derived uh, input function, the blue data with um, blood measurements that she's doing, that she can get uh, uh, quite good correlation between the two. Okay, so that is the plasma input function. Um, one other advantage that I mentioned with optics is that you can, it, it's very easy at least, to measure multiple tracers at the same time. And as with, with that, you, you can apply some interesting tricks. So as Professor Lemertzma mentioned, his reference tissue approaches where you don't have to measure a plasma input function, they're really uh, useful in some cases. However, things like tumors are very difficult uh, to apply this to. And, and he did mention this, um, but you may have missed it. You really need the ratio of K1 over K2 in one tissue in your reference tissue to be equivalent to the K1 over K2 in whatever tissue you're interested in. And I do most of my work in tumor in imaging, so I just took an untargeted fluorescent dye, injected it into a bunch of mice um, with different tumor lines and looked at uh, sort of healthy surrounding tissue. And if I compared the healthy surrounding tissue, uh, many different types, to the K1 over K2 that I was seeing in the tumor, when I want sort of a one-to-one -one ratio of these things for the reference tissue model to work, I'm not getting that at all. In fact, they're scattered all over the place. Uh, so what, what can we do in this case? Um, Dr. Lemertzma talked a lot about the, the compartmental models already, but so I'm going to fly through this a little bit quickly, but essentially if you inject your tracer, right, you, you'll get some kind of uptake maybe in a tumor and you can say that that signal is coming from some in the blood, uh, some in the free space, 
and some in the bound space. And it's really the bound stuff that you're most interested in. Um, and you can write a compartmental model for this, the two tissue compartmental model uh, with uh, you know, the four uh, parameters mentioned. Um, and I, I like to think of K1 and K2 have, having to do with delivery and K3 and K4 having to do with binding. And so it's really the K3 and K4, as Professor Limeritzma mentioned, that are interesting if, you're want, if you want binding. Um, so what, the way we've simplified this, because we can measure a second tracer at the same time, well, why don't we inject one tracer that's targeted to an agent or to a receptor and another tracer that is looks almost identical to that targeted tracer but you know you scramble some uh, molecules around and you make it untargeted so if you inject those two things at the same time can you use an untargeted tracer as the input to the reference tracer model in the same tissue now so then you, you'll measure your uptake of your two tracers in the same tissue at the same time you're targeted in blue and you're untargeted in red and if we look at that new sort of cartoon of what's going on uh, the untargeted tracer is the green stuff and you can see it's sort of in the plasma this is at least the ideal case right and it's kind of in the the free space in equivalent co concentrations as the targeted although that's not the case necessarily for the models I'll show you um, and then only the targeted one can bind specifically to the receptors of interest um, so you can create this new compartmental model for your untargeted tracer it's just got uh, a single tissue compartment and then you can, uh, uh, you know, massage the 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 um, equations, those uh, differential equations that Professor Lemertzma uh, mentioned. And really, this is just taken right out of his simplified reference tissue uh, model. And instead of having a reference tissue now, we replace that with the un the concentration of the untargeted tracer instead. And again, we're um, there, there's probably some oversimplifications based on what Professor Lumertz was, was talking about, but essentially this uh, term at the bottom here, Ka times your B available times an FND as well, um, is you know related to your re receptor concentration, I independent of really how much you inject. So it's a really nice a normalization. Um, and so testing this out, then uh, we took our targeted tracer and untargeted tracer and looked at the uptakes in a uh, in reference tissue in this case this is uh, um, oops, this is just leg oh go back okay this is just uh, leg muscle um, so uh, there shouldn't we, we were targeting epidermal growth factor receptor which is overexpressed in many different types of cancers um, so the what was there and there's very little epidermal growth factor or none in in sort of healthy leg tissue and so you expect if the k1 and k2 are similar or if the tra the untargeted tracer is ideal for this particular targeted tracer that the uptake should be very similar over the the time range that you're you're doing your kinetic modeling over and that seemed to be the case uh, in in the in the leg in the leg muscle and then we also um, in one of the tumor lines that we studied, we um, blocked all the, e the epidermal growth factor receptor in the tumor, blocked it before doing the imaging study. So hopefully there's no specific binding. Um, and again, we found that the uptakes on average over six mice, or maybe it's a little less than that, um, are very similar between the untargeted and the targeted, that's the light blue uh, dashed and solid data. Um, respectively. And then, so if we replot that correlation now, it, but instead of the uh, reference tissue K1 over K2 on the x-axis, we replace that with the untargeted tracer K1 over K2, then all of a sudden we get a very nice correlation, which, you know, suggests that we can use that uh, simplified reference tissue model using our tracer instead. Um, and we, we avoid having to try and find the ideal re reference tissue for tumors. And so, um, I think that I've probably used up most of my time. I'm going to end there then. Um, and oh, no, I just wanted to have a quick su summary slide. I forgot I put this in this morning, actually. Um, 
So I mentioned, uh, I mentioned a number of different approaches with optics that you can use to measure the plasma input function. And then I also mentioned at the beginning of my talk that you could do either first pass kinetics, uh, binding kinetics, have different time scales that you would measure your input function over. And so just quick notes on some of these. So blood sampling, you know, it's, it's not too difficult to do binding kinetic time scales. It might be, it could be possible to do the sort of faster first pass kinetics, and I think there are approaches that are capable of doing that, but it's probably difficult. Um, the direct artery image, imaging, where we expose the carotid artery and image, you can certainly do either first pass or binding kinetics. The dye densitometry, um, it has a lot of, uh, um, it, certain things can't change over time too rapidly, so it doesn't work probably very well. Like, you know, in principle, you could keep using the dye densitometer and measure the input o over a long period of time, but you'd, you'd probably see drift and problems in your ability to do this. But you can certainly do first pass kinetics with dye densitometry. Um, the fluorescence tomography, uh, just the, the ability to get a whole image at, at very quickly makes it maybe difficult to do first pass kinetics. You can certainly do binding kinetics. And then with the reference tracer input, you really can't do first pass kinetics because the binding occurs at sort of a much later rate anyway, and both tracers should look very similar during the first pass kinetics when no binding, no appreciable binding has, has occurred. So I'll, I'll end there and thank a number of people at the Lawson Health Research Institute where I did my PhD who are working with the uh, pulse dye densitometry, and uh, also my collaborators at uh, where I did my postdoc at, at Thayer School of Engineering at Dartmouth College. Thank you.